for joining us. So this today is the What's Next teleconference for LGBTBEs, focusing on business to business and tiered contracting. Uh, we have a great panel for you here today. Um, so I'm, I think most of you know me, but I'm Phil Georgiani. I'm the Director of Supplier Diversity here at the NGLCC. Um, and I'm joined by uh, our LGBTBEs, Dawn Ackerman and George Piper of Outsmart, and Kit Neese of First Choice Financial, and I'm going to give them um, some time to introduce themselves in a moment. Just a few quick housekeeping things. As I mentioned in the email, the call is being recorded, um, so you will be able to access it afterwards on our website once we do our our magic editing to it. Um, and anyone who has a question for me or for the panelists, you can just send them directly to me. You should all have your email because it's what the, the notification went out on, but it's pgeorgiani at nglcc.org. Um, and then I'll kind of, you know, read them as we, as we have time at the end. We have prepared questions, but we definitely want to be able to get to um, all of your questions as well. Um, so just a little bit of an intro, you know, as, as certified LGBTBEs, you all know that kind of, uh, a central benefit of the supplier diversity initiative is the access to our 140 corporate partners who have a commitment to investing in the LGBT community um, and pursuing those opportunities that is important to you and, and supporting your, you know, uh, you guys as you pursue those opportunities is important. But sometimes, you know, often large corporate contracts are something that can take a long time to pursue, and we want to make sure that our LGBT LGBT business owners are kind of pursuing the full breadth of the opportunities available to them. And a huge opportunity is working with each other um, in business-to-business -business relationships. And those business-to-business -business relationships could be in the form of direct, you know, actually contracting, selling goods and services to each other. Um, and then there's also tiered contracting, which essentially is uh, acting as a tier two supplier to an LGBTBE who already is servicing a prime contract but needs needs support in servicing um, that contract. So we're here to kind of explore a little bit about the different ways that that, that can look um, and to give you some examples of, of our business owners who have had success in the past. Um, so I want to introduce, I think we'll start with Dawn and George. Uh, Dawn is the uh, CFO and George is the CEO of Outsmart Office Solutions. They're a green office furniture and office solutions company. Um, that's They've been with us for a long time and they've actually um, – uh, grew out of a partnership between two LGBTBEs, and they're doing some really exciting stuff. So I guess let me let you guys, um, whoever, Dawn or George, wants to talk a little bit about your history and your engagement with the, the NGLCC. Sure. Um, well, I had a small company that sold uh, office uh, equipment and toner cartridges. Uh, I started it back in the late 90s. And George had a company that sold office furniture and did installation and office space planning and design. Also started in late 90s, early 2000s. And both of us, I guess, from our separate cities, I was in Los Angeles and he was in Seattle, learned about the NGLCC and certification very early in the process. And both attended the NGLCC conference in 2005 in San Francisco, where there was a very small group of certified suppliers as well as corporations who were starting to include the LGBTBE certification in their supplier diversity uh, spend. And George and I, while we didn't know each other, I know that uh, when I was talking to corporate representatives about my company, they would say things like, well, have you met the guy that does office furniture? And it turns out they were saying the same thing to him. Have you met the girl that does office, uh, office equipment and toner? And uh, so – as we learned more about certification and understood the opportunities that could very well come from being certified uh, with time, 
it became clear to us that as individual small businesses, uh, our chances of getting a contract might actually be much better if we considered combining our services and building a business that way. And so we that's what we did. In 2007, we formed Outsmart on paper. It wasn't until a few years later that we were really able to start pushing this company uh, together. And, and now in 2013, uh, we've definitely made great strides and have a lot of great opportunities, including our opportunities uh, with Office Depot, which I think we'll be asking us about here later. But, uh, yeah, it, this, all, everything about our business has been from uh, meeting at the NGLCC conference and being certified LGBTBEs and, and building a business accordingly. Yeah, fantastic, and that's one of our we, – we, we love that story here at the NGLCC. Now, you're not always going to find someone who you want to completely merge your business with. Um, that doesn't happen every day, although, you know, there's still kind of up to and including that. There's definitely, more broadly speaking, opportunities for strategic alliance, and, and we'll get into that other and other ways of, of collaboration. Um, so thank you, Don. I also want to tr- introduce Kit Nice. Kit is the CEO and Senior Project Manager of – First Choice Financial, um, and they specialize in designing and building of, and maintenance of government and military facilities, facility systems, um, telecommunications, security, and special projects. Um, and Kit also has a very strong background in um, video and, and photography and editing. Um, and Kit's very been very involved in the Central Pennsylvania Chamber, which is a really it's a really exciting area for us. There's a lot of really strong um, big companies in Central Pennsylvania. Um, so Kit, if you just I guess wanted to talk a little bit about you know your company um, and your background in you know government and, and elsewhere contracting. Sure. Thanks very much, Phil, and especially to Sam and all the other support staff at the NGLCC. It's been um, – I've been certified since late in the summer last year, and so I'm a newbie to the process, process of LGBTBE, um, but not to national and international certification. I'm a United Nations vendor for Tier 1 for this last year. It means that I can work up to a million dollars in, in contracting. There's three tiers with United Nations. I've done government contracting since 1984. I worked for some very small minority-owned businesses and some very large corporations that, as their project specialist in government contracting, um, worked overseas a total of 11 years uh, with the State Department, and my specialty was blast and ballistic design. I got my nickname, Kit. My first name is really Katharina, mm-hmm. um, while working at the White House for the Ridge team right after September 11th. Um, I designed all the uh, the windows and doors uh, after September 11th for the Pentagon and the White House and the EEOB. The executive office building. So um, that lets you know that I go from everything from on-paper contract management all the way through large construction and design. Um, I own this very eclectic woman-owned business. Uh, it's actually an economically disadvantaged woman-owned business under federal contracting. Um, federal contracting, for those that don't know, have different set-asides. Um, Unfortunately, they don't have LGBT set-asides yet, but we're working on that. Uh, There's women-owned business, veteran, um, 8A, of which I'm an 8A and an 8M. 8M means it's a woman-owned business. 8A is a set-aside for a diversity uh, business, particularly minority. Um, It has to do with how much money you make a year. Um, My company, First Choice Financial Group, started out as a mortgage business and a contracting company that um, took on federal projects for um, people like the the federal court system. If they wanted a business investigated or they wanted someone to help them better prepare to do contracts on a large scale with GSA, they called me and I would walk that company through from registering all the way to the end. Um, From then on, I decided to go back into construction and facilities management, so I divided my company into three divisions. One is Provisio, do a lot of work with the United Nations, um, and we do project management. Uh, Basically, I say that we manage widgets. If you need something managed, we can do it. Um, anywhere in the world. Shelter Plus, I manufacture 
mobile teaching and medical facilities that are used by the United Nations and first choice facilities. We have facilities maintenance contracts, which sometimes it's janitorial and sometimes it's a specialty project. Currently, we have two specialty projects for the Veterans Administration. Um, and you're going to say, well, you know, how can a small business divide itself into three divisions? What I know about contracting and keep itself small in a small group of people, and I have 15 subcontractors. I'm a prime contractor, and I hire other LGBTBEs and individual. Right now, all my subcontractors are gay and lesbian or transgendered, and I that, for me, is a really great experience. Up until this last year, it wasn't until I joined my local chamber here in Harrisburg and um, became certified. I pretty much was across the board, people that I had worked with for years. And then I made a, a conscious effort that when I got projects, I was going to reach out to people in the chamber, people that I had heard of in the community, and help them along in the process. Um, most of the people... I think when I came to this chamber, I was the only person that specialized in contracting, any kind of bid contracting. So there is a great learning curve to that, and um, I'm glad to say that we have a supplier diversity committee now, and we're starting to work and work on um, – and you're, I'm sorry, you're, you're referring to the Central Pennsylvania Chamber. Yes, yeah. the Central Pennsylvania Chamber. And, and from that has come some really good conversations with other vendors and with other larger companies that are now starting to see some of the people that I've helped along and saying, well, you know, we're a prime contractor. You know, Kit's worked with you. We'd really like to work with you also. Um, there is no mystery to contracting. It's like running a marathon. It's extremely difficult to prepare and do all the really hard work up front. But once you get there, you just repeat it time after time and again. If you are already an LGBTBE, you have everything you need to become a federal or state contractor. You have everything in place. You've had to submit your taxes. You have EIN numbers. You have your corporate setup or your LLC or, or um, sole proprietor, and you're ready to go. You just have to sort of make that decision. Thanks, Kit. That that's amazing, and I actually didn't even I didn't know until you said that that all of your all of your subcontractors were actually LGBTBE. So that's that's quite amazing. Um, and you know that's something that will definitely get you on a teleconference. I can tell you that. Um, I, I'm proud of our community. I, is, I really am, and I am proud of how diverse businesses have come to the forefront mm -hmm. and said, "Listen, we want to learn other things too. We don't want to just just do one thing." In order, why I have three parts to my company is because. The, a small business has to be able to cover payroll and cover all their expenses year-round. And so for the government and state, it's all cyclical. Sometimes government has bids out, sometimes United Nations, sometimes local. And what I tried to do was cover it for at least three seasons of the year. So. Yeah, that's 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 really terrific, and that's definitely um, you know a model we're seeking to to kind of disseminate and and expand. Um, so I just we're going to go and just let everyone listening know if you if you have questions already if there's anything that you know whether it's a specific question or just a topic area that that you'd like us to address you can start absolutely sending those questions to me now it's Pete Giorgiani at nglcc.org um, before we went into the questions I just wanted to make sure everyone knew a little bit about you know the resources that are available to them as LGBTBEs immediately that are interested in in business and business contracting or in you know engaging along other points of the supply chain so you know as you all know you as certified LGBTBEs you have access to the information of the other LGBTBEs we're just nearly at 500 now um, so you are able to reach out directly if you can always reach out to the staff here if you're seeking, um, if, if you know you're engaged as a prime supplier and you're seeking, you know, um, companies to partner with or subcontract under you, we can we can provide that advice. Or if you're if you think you'd be a good fit for a specific a specific kind of of prime contractor or or looking for guidance in the ways to kind of do that outreach, um, we're available um, 
For that, we do have at our conference that's coming up in Dallas, July 31st to August 2nd. Um, we have the Industries Clusters at Conference, which is specifically aimed at getting people in specific commodities together to facilitate that connectivity. Um, so, you know, it may be uh, kind of along Don and George's line, you may be looking for someone who's doing something similar but not the exact same thing for – and whether, you know, for a partnership, either in a partnership on a contract that exists or, you know, one that you anticipate in the future. Um, so we currently, just to run through really quickly, the industry clusters we're planning to have are advertising, marketing, communications, that's one, uh, professional services, including human resources, accounting, consulting, and legal is one, is uh, the second one, uh, a real estate cluster, uh, consumer goods, promotional, and retail is the next one, events and entertainment, and architecture and design. Um, so those are what we're planning to have right now that's in the conference and in Dallas. And, of course, the entire conference is also an opportunity to interface directly with you know, the other LGBTBEs, so whether they're in a similar a similar commodity area or completely different. Um, so I guess that's a good segue to our questions. So specifically, I was going to, uh, towards Outsmart, since you guys have been with us for a long time, if you're going to the conference, kind of what is a good way, you know, if you're in the mindset of, of pursuing other other businesses for uh, a possible partnership or possible, you know, tiered contracting opportunity, a good strategy for finding them out and maybe, and maybe you know, evaluating whether they're a good fit or not. George, do you want me to take this? Yeah. Yeah, I just okay. want to start that. Sure. Um, I, I would say that really it's about thinking about what your company does and, and, and has to offer and maybe what you might be lacking or could use more strength in a certain, you know, part of it. Or if you've had the opportunity maybe to look at some contracting opportunities where if you just had this extra support or this extra, you know, for us it could be just a different product that we need to be able to offer. Um, that's where partnerships can really come into play. And the fact that we're all LGBTBEs, for me, I think is right away a good plus in, you know, in the right direction. It's like, hey, you know, there's not a whole lot of us. It's not like there are millions of us out there um, that are certified. So for us to be able to work together is only going to make the certification stronger and the entire NGLCC um supplier movement better for everybody. So getting to know other certified suppliers, and we've spent many years at the conference meeting other people uh, who do similar things to what we do, seeing if there's any way in which we can, you know, work together to be able to sell some of the, pro the products that they do or, or whatever. And um, right now we've found that we've been able to partner with a couple of other LGBTBEs, and we also use other LGBTBEs their goods and services, um, and a lot of other LGBTBE buy from us for our goods and services. So, you know, there's a lot of partnership opportunities. You don't mm -hmm. necessarily have to go form a new business with someone like George and I did, and that's a whole different story. But um, uh, there are there are a lot of ways that we can work together, and you just have to take the time to to, to spend time at the conference, getting to know the other business owners, and you know, don't just limit yourself to your city because Mm -hmm. it, it, it's, you know, with technology and the way things are today, we do business with other LGBTBs all across the country. And um, we, have, we have clients that come from the Atlanta Gay Chamber and, the, um, and Cabo in Connecticut and New York and Seattle and San Francisco and Los Angeles. So really, it, I love the conference for that reason. It, it gives me an opportunity to meet people from all over the country and and it also gives you reasons to travel all over the country to go visit <laughs> clients and <laughs> possible partners. So that's yeah. That's yeah. Been, oh, sorry, George. Oh no, I, I was I was just going to um, um, add to that. I think the um, you know when we when we met uh, Office Depot for the first time, I think you know Don and I were both you know terrified. Oh God, here's the big competition, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. Um, it, it's not the case. I, I, I think you, um, you know, lead with curiosity and 
um, especially in the case of, you know, the other LGBTBEs that we meet, um, there are so many opportunities um, to partner and not look at um, their business as competition. Um, find those places where you complement uh, one another. Um, you know, it's, it's like we may not, we may have a client in a certain area in the country where we're just not on the ground, but that business is. And, you know, there's a perfect opportunity um, for our client then to be serviced by another LGBTVE mm-hmm. within that area. So there's lots of opportunities to um, partner. And I, I think if you um, are at the conference and you um, have that open mind to, you know, with curiosity to seek those other folks, um, there's a lot of win-win situations out there. Yeah, absolutely. And I, you know, I, I can just say from the staff perspective and, you know, it's, um, when thinking about like the matchmaker um, meetings and when you are, you know, going into those, those opportunities where you're facing the corporate partners, the corporate partners really are looking for solutions. So if you can come to them and say, you know, I have, depending on, you know, what the specific issue is that they're looking for a solution for to be able to say, you know, I have this strategic partnership that can bring you a broader solution and it's in and it's a diverse spend and it's in and it's in one package. And, you know, you might want to think about if you're in terms of what your customers are asking for, if you're kind of being pushed in a new direction or to provide um, a new service, to think about, well, does it make sense to it doesn't make sense for us to develop this capacity to to provide this new service, or is this something that we can we can find another um, LGBTBE who specializes in this, and this person, you know, is our or this other enterprise is our is our strategic partner, and then you know it's kind of a ready-made, out-of-the-box solution for for a corporate partner. Um, so just actually pivoting off of that. Speaking of the corporate partners, we, I definitely wanted you guys, um, John and George, to talk a little bit about your partnership with, with Office Depot, which is really exciting. Sure. Um, we, uh, um, like I said, we, <laughs> at that, the conference in 2009 in Seattle, um, Don and I had a booth um, at the conference, and directly across from us was Office Depot's booth. <laughs> and I think... Um, you know, at first we were a little intimidated by the fact that they were there, and we thought, you know, oh gosh, you know, now the the big guys are here, and and um, what's that going to mean for our um, certification? And and um, we realized that um, if if people are truly looking at the value of community and the value of um, how they're spending their dollars, um, I you know I'm. I have to give it up for Kit and, you know, a lot of the things that she said about um, all the relationships that she has with her um, partners that are also LGBTBEs and um, looking at spending um, your money with um, LGBTBT. I'm going to totally mess that up. LGBTBE. <laughs> um, it's a mouthful. Um, I, I, I think it's, you know, um, uh, in the in the uh, chamber uh, movement, a lot of folks talk about the the pink dollar and that spend, um, and, and I think we we um, have to strategically um, do that as a as a as a you know call to action um, because it, it really talks you know broader about our community and how we um, support one another. Um, but I think, um, you know, our specific uh, relationship with uh, Office Depot um, came about in the fact that they had this incredible uh, Tier 1 diversity program. Mm-hmm. And what they were looking for from us was actually including um, the first uh, LGBT business uh, within their uh, program um, to really show that they as a corporate um, entity were really taking that that larger step to include um, an LGBTBE and not, you know, step on, you know, the opportunity for for us to gain business, but really looking at us as a, as a partnership in um, gaining um, that business. And the, the truth is for us, um, you know, Don and I were in our specific markets, and by partnering with Office Depot, it allowed us to leverage – their uh, distribution and um, their price point 
um, which we couldn't uh, compete on previously. And so now um, we have the benefit of offering um, an LGBTBE at a specific price point that's out there that people expect with national distribution. You know, what a, you know, a win for us and what a win for Office Depot to um, now include an LGBTBE, um, which, you know, through our relationship, they actually did some work and went from, I think at the low was 45 on the uh, HRC Corporate Equality Index to getting 100%. And that was through leveraging their partnership with us. So um, there's just a lot of opportunity. And um, we're, we know that we would have never had that opportunity to be in front of Office Depot had we not been an, a certified LGBTBE. Yeah, that's fantastic. And that's um... – you know, a little bit outside the box in terms of business to business, since that is a corporate facing relationship. But you know, it's a strategic right. partnership. It's not as strictly you're a vendor to them. Um, so there are are opportunities for engagement with that. Office Depot really stands out in terms of um, that kind of robustness. Um, but there are other ways, you know, to be thinking about how you can provide. Um, a solution uh, for a company like that and how obviously they're prov providing a really great solution for you as well. Um, so to pivot a little um, and going back to Kit, and I know we had talked about this the other day. Um, so, you know, for a lot of larger companies that are pursuing, whether it's specifically federal, but even, you know, corporate contracting too, they have dedicated um, – project management or business development staff, whereas for some smaller LGBTBEs, they, it's either just them or they don't have a dedicated staff person for that. So can you maybe talk about what a smaller a smaller company, how they can think, how they can strategize, how they can use their resources when they're looking to pursue um, contracts with prime suppliers? Sure. Um, well, you have to sort of understand why a prime supplier would – want to work with you. For me, um, I do researching and planning all the time. Every morning I get up and for an hour I look at what bids are out there and who's bidding. I look at people that register on the federal bid opportunities and some of, some of the times I can tell, let's just take for example video. Uh, there is probably maybe a hundred of us that do the kind of video, commercial video for the government that I do. Um, and so I look out there, and when I see a new name, I Google them, and I, you know, go to, and normally I'll send them an email off, and I'll say, hey, just wanted to check in. I see you're doing also this bid. Wanted to talk a little bit about what we do and what you do. Quite frankly, I'm probably not competition for you, but if I bid this as the prime, what services can you offer me? So from a prime standpoint, I'm always looking for value engineering. I'm always looking for someone to bring something different to the table. But from years of doing this, I know that the most important thing for me is not so much how much you know or how much experience. I'll bring you on if if our vision and our work ethics are similar. I'm a workaholic. I mean, an OCD workaholic, and I know that. And not everybody is, and I'm willing to do that extra and bring someone out on a subcontractor if they're easy to work with and can sort of um, switch it up a little bit. If they can say, if they can be a little bit more flexible. Um, last year, I got a large bid to do a Department of Interior video all across the United States, do a bunch of filming, put it all together for the Office of Inspector General. And my normal subcontractor I went to was like, oh, well, I can't meet those price points and I can't do this. So I went to somebody new and I said, listen, this is, you know, you're going to have to fly here, you're going to have to fly there, turn it around really quickly. Are you willing to do that? And they said, absolutely. And it turned out perfect. So I, I just think um, flexibility, letting mm -hmm. your prime contractors know about you. Don't be afraid of, of emails and press releases. I mean, mm -hmm. I read every press release I get from a sub, potential subcontractor. I read capability statements. Mm -hmm. A strong capability statement says to me, in 50 words or less, you can describe everything you've got to offer me. And so for me, and I do the same with my general contractors, they know who I am because, number one, I'm persistent. Two, I send them my capability statements, 
and I'm there for every job that they send me. I will either tell them, this looks like my purview or this doesn't, and I'll be really honest. I just won't let that email go, and will you bid this for me overnight? I'll say, listen, you gave me too little time, so I'm going to say no this time, but keep sending me, and I will confirm every time I, I get that correspondence. Right. That is really good insight, and obviously it's, of course, best practice if you don't have a capabilities um, you know, like a one pager or something, then that's something you should really uh, be thinking about putting together. Um, and those, those are useful. They're useful at the conference, and they're also useful, you know, as Kit said, to actually send to people that you're considering or that you're pursuing work with. Um, so actually, one thing that you, you you know you did mention in terms of uh, working with your subcontractors, I'm going to pivot. Um, to a question that we had from our from our studio audience. Um, so we have someone who works with um, works with another diverse business at the moment, and the relationship has turned into fulfillment of the business um, that he sends, that the questioner sends, and they're getting a bit expensive, or they're more expensive than he anticipated. Um, how best do I have that conversation that I feel that the relationship should be two-way and not just one way? We should be referring business back and forth and also kind of adding my own spin. I think this also really goes to how do you establish in the beginning? Because obviously, you know, you have your capability sheet and you have, like, what you can do. And this is, you know, for all, for all the panelists. Um, how do you know you to make sure, to kind of strategies for making sure you mesh well and making sure that you both, have the same idea of what's coming out of that relationship, if that if that makes sense as a question. Sure. I think when, let's say just business to business, um, I, I always ask the person that I'm about to do business with for their business plan. And sometimes I'll ask them for their financials, not in detailed financials, but but what do they really charge when they're when they have a commercial uh, customer? Are they charging forty five dollars a square foot or one hundred and twenty dollars, you know, for half an hour? Or I sort of want to know before I get into a partnership with somebody: um, one, that they're stable; two, that they're going to be able to pull half their weight or at least a majority of their part. I'm willing to do 200% if they're willing to do 100% back. But um, if the quality of documentation is not there from the very beginning, then that always puts up a red flag for me. And um, I'm a quality control person. And I have a reputation of does not play well with others because I'll be excruciatingly <laughs> blunt in the beginning and say, hey, listen, something about this doesn't look right, or this is what this is what the going rate is. I, I like people that work with me to know, to do a little bit of research on their own, okay, I'm doing this kind of a service, and this is what the federal government's paying for that kind of service. It's easy enough to find on the GSA schedule or any place else or from contract awards. So if you come in at like, a big red herring, then I know automatically that you're not realistic about a partnership. So. And how to address it once you've gotten in bed and mm -hmm. after that, just, you know, whether it's if you're doing it on your own and you don't have a bookkeeper, sometimes it's best to have a bookkeeper sit down with you and say, listen, these just don't match up or the expectations that we had in the beginning need to be revisited and we need to put a new or an addendum to our business plan and say, listen, things have changed. We've gotten education along the way. And now, the, the, you know, the easiest way to say the economic climate is different. Let's reevaluate what we're doing. And I think everyone knows when they hear that, says, ah, something's not right here. Right. So we're going to reevaluate it. And uh, it just says it's not making dollars and cents. And quite frankly, there's a lot of people that I'd love to work with, but I don't work with them because they, they're they not really conscious of the dollars and cents. Mm -hmm. So in the end, we all have to make a living. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's I think that's excellent. Um Advice and unfortunately, sometimes there there might be a difficult conversation that that does have to happen, and it will be difficult. Um, so, um, another question: uh, How can a professional specializing in eco, smart, energy efficient? Uh, this is uh, a specific business owner. Obviously, um, they do. Um, 
uh, energy efficient interior architectural design okay. and also furniture design and production. Okay. Um, and specifically the question was um, uh, around how they can develop uh, relationships with the GSA, but I also wanted to make sure I got um, input from George to talk about in addition to the GSA, which is the General uh, Services Administration with the federal government, um, since you guys do this, if you wanted to talk a little bit about developing relationships, you know, with state and local federal agencies and whether it's specific to, you know, architecture, design, um, that kind of commodity family or just in general, uh, specifically around how to start the relationship? Sure. Um, I think, you know, depending on your area, if you're um, – I know here um, locally in the Seattle area, we just had our regional contracting forum, which is a reverse trade show that um, all the um, local entities – uh, have come together to put on. So it's City of Seattle, Port of Seattle, Port of Tacoma, State of Washington, um, Washington Department of Transportation, and so on. And um, there's very similar um, opportunities, um, you know, state by state. Um, they might uh, set it up differently. But there's there's usually the general um, buckets um, that uh, businesses fall in, um, that government um, usually puts them in, which is either um, your construction, your architectural architects uh, and engineering, or your goods and services. Um, and you know, the the way to engage is actually to go to these um, these uh, uh, events um, where you um, get to meet them. And they're very similar to. Um, the matchmaker meetings that uh, um, is put on by NGLCC at the conferences, um, and you um, go and you talk about your capabilities and you uh, really introduce uh, your company um, and find out what, what opportunities um, are, are coming down the pike. Um, most government agencies will list um, on their websites, um, or you can certainly call their um, supplier diversity or, or contracting uh, departments and find out, um, you know, when was the last time um, what I specifically sell came up as a, a um, service or commodity um, for bid. Um, and generally those, those contracts will last, you know, uh, three, five, seven years. Um, so once you're in um, as, a, as a prime, um, it, it, it's a it's a great opportunity, um, but that's that's kind of where um, I, I would say um, start with those those agencies um, because once you once you're in I, I Kit said this earlier um, that um, you know once once you get that once you do that first big contract <laughs> um, it is painful. Um, as uh, Dawn can certainly attest to, she um, did the bulk of, uh, you know, writing for our, our um, first uh, large bit. And, uh, but once you do that, you can replicate it um, over and over again. And uh, it, it's, it's, even if you don't win, it's a very valuable process to go through um, the first time. So um, I don't know if I'm – quite answered the the well i mean i the, think it's a you know it's a big question so i'm not sure it's kind of not that it's unanswerable but there's so it has such depth uh, i do think that's really important information um it, oh. there's 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 a lot of avenues um it, you know in into um government contracting mm -hmm. um but you have to you you know it's just like any um, you know B two B relationship. You have to let them know that you exist um, just by registering and you know signing up on um, a roster uh, doesn't necessarily you know garner you business. You might right. know when the next bid is coming up, but you, you really have to do some you know face to face time and and um, get those people who are making the decisions know who you are and know what your business. Mm -hmm. um, provides. Yeah, and there are, and you know, I think it's a matter of being on the lookout. You know, as you said, that the the GSA, the federal agencies, um, also local agencies, they do have um, 
occasional matchmaker conferences or fairs or I'm sorry, conferences, you know, which contain within them uh, matchmaker meetings. There's also, you know, the local SBA. Again, obviously, I'm talking about federal now, but you can walk into um, – uh, meet with the, your local SBA representative, and they can give you really specific guidance about where, you know, about your area and what's being spent in your area. Um, so, Kit, and I guess uh, going to you in this, I'm trying to, I guess, parse this in a way that that isn't just completely too huge to answer. But in terms of working with the GSA, and obviously there's the process of getting on the GSA schedule. Um, and we specifically did a teleconference on the GSA schedule, which I believe is available on our website, and they also have those resources. So I don't, you don't need to explain that whole process, but in terms of if you're wanting to engage with the GSA, and I guess with an eye towards R, are there ways, and I don't know if you, if you said this before, it might be incorrect, is it, can you find out the people, is it publicly available who, who is already a prime supplier to whether it's, you know, the GSA or just on the GSA schedule or working with other end industries in your commodity and then just reaching out to them with your capability statement, is that kind of the first step? Sure. Um, one of the first steps, and I think it's very telling, is you go to the GSA schedule and you put in your NIACS code or you go through and find that you, that you can put in a search name. Okay, I do office chairs. And then everyone that does has a contract to do office chairs has their capability and their contract out there, and they have to give their rates. So a lot of times when small contractors don't know what to charge, go to the GSA schedule, pick someone in your geographic location, go down through and say, oh, well, for this they're charging blank, for this, and print a couple of those out. I mean, they make it um, – painfully honest what they they do mm -hmm. my company is not on the gsa schedule because i like the flexibility of giving some of my regular clients discounts and unfortunately mm -hmm. when you're on the DS gsa schedule everybody is equal mm -hmm. if you give those discounts there you're going to have to give the discounts to your federal people too mm -hmm. so um just for me as a small company it doesn't work but i have lots of friends that it really works for um the same way comes to the state, for example, the Pennsylvania Department of State on their Department of Treasury has a list of every contract and a copy of the contract that they awarded for the last five years. So you can go on there and you say, well, I'm bidding the facilities maintenance job at the state park. What did they pay the last time? And that gives you an idea. You match their scope with the scope of the new contract and say, well, if they were paying this and I add the cost of living to it that the federal government, you know, like the 1.23 to it, then I should know what where my bid should be. And if you look at it and say, no way could I do it at that, that was one bid I would just pass over and go to the next. Um, every year at the end of the fiscal year, um, the federal government puts out an Excel spreadsheet, and they put every contract. You just go onto FBO.gov, and you can download every contract that they've awarded in every commodity, um, other than things that they call just JNAs, justification and authorization. They don't have to give that amount. Those are for those special people, like really big defense contractors and – uh, the, that, there is some mystery to that, but um, whatever it is, they felt that no one else could give them those same services for the same price. So, right. Um, it's a really pretty much a open book, and for somebody starting out new, it's it, it's an easy to find out what you know what your product and what your time is worth. Yeah, and then I, I I I think it's a good way to. Um, to kind of determine if this is the area, you know, federal or government contracting in general, working as a subcontractor is going to give you an idea because you're going to be meeting those com the same compliance and reporting requirements just because those will be kind of getting the, – the prime contractor will be – has to meet the compliance for working with the federal government. Therefore, you will. So we'll kind of give you an idea if that's something that, you know, is – is right for you if it's something that your your enterprise responds well to, um, and it's something we certainly you know NGLCC as an organization is certainly um, very supportive and working hard towards expanding federal government um, contracting opportunities for LGBTBEs, but that's not the same as saying that 
every LGBTBE should be a government contractor and that it's right for everyone because that's that's um, definitely a distinction. Um, you know, the other interesting thing, Phil, is, for example, okay, last year I bid 139 federal contracts, okay? So I have 139 places out there on Google that had my name added to those contracts, so it's free advertising. Sometimes if there's a prime contractor I want to work with, I'll bid everything. I'll, I'll put at least a, a request for information or that I'm interested in this job so that they keep seeing my name time after time. And a couple of large, large contractors from D.C. recently called me and they said, listen, we see you all the time out there on Google. What are you doing and what can you do to work with us? So sometimes it's just an, a different kind of advertising. Yeah, so there's kind of there's many, many ways to skin the cat, um, and it's about kind of what works best for, you know, where you're, you know, your commodity and where you're approaching it from. Um, well, fantastic. Um, I just wanted to thank you guys again. I think that was that was a really um, some amazing insight that you shared. Um, uh, just to everyone on the call, as I mentioned before, this is recorded and we are going to be sharing it on the website. So if you want to re-listen to it or if you want to, um, you know, we'll be sending the links out to all the LGBTBEs, but if you want to share it, um, you'll be able to. Um, and with that, we can conclude. Thank you guys, Kit and Don and George. Thank you all so much. This is really uh, very valuable. Thank you so much, Phil. All right, thank, thank you. you, and thank you, everyone, for joining. Mm-hmm.